We had that, that shutdown because Tim Pawlenty would not compromise. Now, you know what's happened in other legislative sessions. We haven't been particularly successful. But when I was leader in 2005, along with Dean Johnson, the Senate leader, we went to Plenty and said, you have to compromise. And you know what he said? He said, Democrats aren't going to stand up. Well, we stood him down. And it took a government shutdown to do that, and it's not the way things should work because there should be compromise, but he wouldn't. But when, even after a lot of Democrats said, you know what, Matt, the best thing in the world would be is if Tim Plenty won, because then we'll blame him and we'll go back and then people will have to vote for us because they'll see how bad it gets. And Dean and I said, that's not the kind of politics that we want to be involved in. And on the seventh day of the shutdown, the governor collapsed and recognized uh, that if he was going to get out of the session without a lot of bad press or whatever else he was worried about, he'd have to raise revenue. That was the health care impact <coughs> fee. And where did we put the money? We put it into health care and we saved Minnesota care, which he wanted to get rid of. We put it into our schools, we put it in our communities. And that's the kind of candidate and campaign I'm running for governor. But I'm not just talking about it, I've done it. I'm the only candidate that took Tim Plenty out. Okay, got a follow-up question for you. Uh, you know, you're going to be branded probably as a tax and spend liberal, like we always are. Um, how will you mobilize people? How will you get them uh, behind you, get them to vote for you, and get them to follow you in, when, when you're governor? How many of you are familiar with Minnesota 2020, Progressive Public Policy Think Tank? I founded that in uh, the spring of 2007 because I was tired of the fact that conservatives dominated the airwaves and with their so-called ideas. And what's their idea? Their idea is always the same. Cut, slash, cut, slash, and bring things backwards. And I wanted a strong progressive voice that was going to go out there with strong messages about how we could move things forward. And uh, I reject the politics. The conservatives always want us in this box where they say we're for less taxes and progressives are for more taxes. We're for opportunity. And that's the way I operated as leader in the House. And my campaign for governor is not that we're going to fight over limited pie. We're going to grow the pie. That's why I'm so uh, passionate and talk all the time about the clean energy economy. We're going to grow the economy, but we're going to do it the right way. And what does that do? Amongst other things, that creates more tax revenue. It creates more jobs and opportunity. And when you have a positive vision and you have a clear one, that's how you move things forward. Okay, our next... Uh Paul, you're our next speaker. Uh, my name is Paul Silvicinski. I'm a farmer and farm organizer from southwestern Minnesota. Racism is present throughout all regions of Minnesota, including rural Minnesota. Immigrants working on large-scale factory farms and in food processing industries face constant discrimination. This issue really struck home to me a couple years ago when I was president of the Higher Ed Committee in which the DREAM Act was under consideration. It was beyond belief to see the hatred in the eyes of people testifying against, testify against the opportunity for children to have access to financial aid to go to college. The hatred was because the children being discussed were sons and daughters of immigrants. As I sat there that day, I couldn't help but remember a story my mom told me uh, back when she was a nurse in World War II and was in the South riding on a bus and having a delightful conversation with a young black girl and the looks of hatred she got and was asked to move to the back of the bus. And she said no. My mom taught me two things with that story. The value of human life and to stand up. So what will you do as a candidate for governor to step away from tapping people's fear and playing on the divisions in our community on race? And what is your plan in talking about race to build community and hope? Thank you. I, I, that's a, it's a great question. Um, well, here's a question to ask you. Why is Representative Keith Ellison supporting me? Why is Representative Cy Tao, one leader in the House, supporting me? Why is Representative, Representative Carlos Mariani Rosa supporting me? And so many other leaders of the various communities of color. How come when I went to the Red Lake uh, Indian Reservation and Gary was helping to take me around, the uh, Tribal Council said I was the first candidate who reached out to them? And it was the same at Leech Lake, and it was the same at White Earth, and it's been the same at every other uh, tribal community that I've gone to. Uh, the reason why I've gotten that support is because I'm not just talking about it now because I'm running for governor. I've been there, and I've been there again and again and again. One of the first bills I carried as a legislator was a bill to stop the elimination of all the councils of color, which were being abolished, abolished by a law that was passed by DFL legislature and signed by Governor Arnie Carlson before I got into office. 
and we saved the Chicano Latino Council and the Asian Pacific Islander Council and all the other councils of color, uh, which is one of the reasons why so many of the people who are board members of those groups are now supporting it. People like Lee Pao Zhang, uh, who is a great leader in the Hmong community, and others like Pal Yang, uh, because I've been there. Uh, when I was leader of the Democrats, and Carlos Mariani turned to me and said, we need to make sure that our caucus is together on things like the DREAM Act, we made sure that we were together. And I have a long voting record on that. And I'm proud that my community of Worthington, where I'm from, is a community that's a community of Latinos, and of whites, and of Somalis, and of Ethiopians, and of Eritreans, and the whole diversity that we have in the state of Minnesota. And in a small town, uh, everything plays out in one place. And I've worked with groups like the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. And you talk to John Keller, who's the executive director there, about how I've gone down and done volunteer work to help people to become citizens uh, and work as a volunteer to make sure that a community comes together, uh, particularly after the really horrible raids that ICE conducted down there, uh, raids that really tore a community apart. So uh, that's my track record, uh, and that's what I've done. Uh, that's not talk. That's something that I've done year in and year out. Uh, one of the other things I want to point out is this. When uh, 20 years ago, when we had people in Wisconsin uh, that were going out holding signs saying, you know, spear a squaw, not a walleye, I was the one who led the lawyers and the law clerks, and we went in and collected the evidence, went out in the boats with the natives during the walleye spearing, and then got the injunctions and shut the races down. That's the sort of stuff I've done for years. Uh, I would like to do a follow-up question for that. And it is really, really great that there's so many diverse people of individuals who are supporting you. It's fantastic. But what we do know that it is also uh, what I would call institutional racism, where you have community of color who are falling through gaps here. And there is a large proportion of racial disparities within education, within the healthcare system, within the criminal justice system, and on and on and on. So what will you do as governor on race to close racial disparities within those systems? Well, let's start with this. Uh, we've never had a cabinet and a leadership team that the governor's had that reflects the diversity of our state, ever. Uh, Democrat or Republican, although the memory of the last Democratic governor is getting pretty old. Uh, and that's what we need to do. And now that, I'm not just making a commitment that that's going to happen. Let's talk about what I've actually done. Uh, when I was elected leader of the Democrats, uh, in the Minnesota State House, one week after Paul Wellstone died, uh, I then took a look at the staff that we had. There was no one, no one from the community of color. So what I did is I asked newly elected member of the House, Keith Ellison, to become head of our uh, committee that would then hire a new staff. And I was criticized for that because people said, well, he's new. What does he know? And I said, well, one of the things he knows is he understands the importance of diversity. And they said, well, that's not fair. It shouldn't be someone like Keith. It needs to be someone who's been around for a long time. And I said, no, it's going to be key. And when I left four years later, we not only had a little diversity, we had diversity in every department. And I had people like Greg Gray, former state representative, who was one of my top people, and others. And that's why Greg and others are supporting me today. Thank you.